ABC gets me as a fringe character and a nobody. What I didn't realize, it would, I still didn't get it. I never got it. I got it because, once again, nobody's watching my back. They never let me, they never let me get an, they never let an agent get anywhere near me. So the only person who was watching my back was Agnes Nixon. I just found out in 1973 when she sold the show, I found out. She was, and I had a hard job with that because I thought to myself, oh, those, she was responsible for those hard edge, uh, uh, re re renewals that I was stuck with. That meant that she was, I, I was always so far behind. Something happened. Al and I were out at lunch one day. And um, this is really the, uh, and he, he was interested in directing, so he knew both, both we, were all, we were sort of under the same, he was talking when we finished lunch, just, we were friends, you know. We heard that Doris Quinlan was being fingered for um, getting rid of her. And Al was horrified. He came back and he told me, you know what those guys told me? They told me that they're going, that the management is going, ABC is going to go after um, Doris. Doris. And uh, he had a very good relationship with her. He'd go up to her office and they were almost buddies. So he said, uh, I'm going to, I don't think she knows. So uh, when we got back to the studio where we shoot, he, he went up to her, and she didn't know. She was horrified. And um, Al said, came back. He said, uh, she doesn't know. I think we ought to do, she, she, it came to her as an absolute shock. I think we ought to tell her. And so we went, uh, so he suggested that we go to his apartment and uh, write a letter, a cast letter. Now, uh, I was... I had, I had split feelings about that because I thought it was terribly unfair because I thought she was a good direct, a, a good producer. producer. But I, I also knew that she had, uh, when she was, she, she had done two things that were really distressing to me. Um, uh, we were, there was a, a magazine called Daytime Television. And they did a library series in which for a year they did one, uh, a special issue devoted just to one story. And they had done the storyline for us. And um, in his elegance, Paul St. Dennis had allowed uh, Doris Quinlan to uh, pose her own staff, her own, her own people. They came to take the picture, but he had told, told her in advance she would be the one who would be allowed to pose her own cast for both the cover and the, uh, uh, the centerpiece, the center page, the center, the center page spread. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when the picture was taken, Doris worked from a graph and she sent me to the back row in a line of men. There were only two, as it ended up, there were only two women in the picture who were original stars. Doris Bellack, who sat down on the front couch with her family, and Ellen Holly, who stood in the back row. And um, I took the position, I didn't say anything about it. Uh, and Paul Dennis never said anything about it, but I'm sure he was given the way he thought. I think he would have been shocked at what she, did, what she had done. But do you know who was angry about where he put me? The white crew. They were furious. They felt that I was responsible for all that that show was getting, and they were angry that I was put in the back row. One guy said to me, gorgeous guy, my God, he looked like Sean Connery. He looked more gorgeous than anything they had in front of the camera. He said to me, honey, they could shove you to the back of the bus, but you're the only one in the whole bunch who looks like a movie star. 
<laughs> I love that guy to this day. <laughs> anyway, the, the picture was worse than it seemed. I was very aware that nobody spoke Lillian's name. And I didn't bring it up because I felt so uncomfortable with management. I really didn't know what was going on. Immediately I called Lillian and, and I found out that they never even told her that the shoot was taking place. We didn't say another word about it because we both knew that wasn't an accident. Because if she had been where she properly should be, she would have been right next to Doris Bellack on that front couch. I would have been on the arm of the chair where there was somebody else and I would have been standing right behind us. But that would have made her, because she looked so different from everybody else, the star of the picture. And the two blondes they cared about, Jackie Courtney and the third Vicky, would have looked like a pair of bookends. They weren't about to let that happen. And so they didn't even get in touch with her at all. So I have that against her. I went along with the letter. But at the end of the letter, Al said to me, um, you're lucky you're not married. You don't have anybody you have to watch out for. I do. And he had a wife who was, to give him credit, he had a wife who had some problems, medical problems. So I was aware of that. He said, I would prefer if you didn't go into my part in the letter. And I, I'm not stupid. I knew what he was doing. So I can't say that he fooled me, because he didn't. I knew that if it worked out and Doris Quinlan was kept on the basis of the letter, he would out himself as the knight in shining armor who came to her defense. And if it didn't work out that way, it was all on me. I knew that. So I take it on myself that I was dumb enough to go out and do that. That's all on El Stupido. Okay. So I went out and I took the, and I had to twist arms to get people to do that. Well, and I went up to the tower at ABC and handed it over to all the big brass, the letter from the, the uh, cast. They got angry. They gave Doris Quinn and her walking papers at the end of the week. She had to clean out her desk and be gone. And she was angry with me. <laughs> because I had put my black face into it and screwed things up. She was angry that the two blondes hadn't done it because that's who Fred Silverman would have paid attention to. And by sticking my black face in it, I had messed her up. So everybody was uh, upset with me about that letter, including uh, Agnes Nixon. I got the first phone call I had heard from Agnes Nixon in a dog's age. She got on the phone and let me know that um, uh, it was very upsetting that the cast was getting into, and I realized that Joe Stewart was coming on the show, show as her favorite protege because she was the one who was pulling the chair out from Doris Quinlan her own producer. And from then on, of course, I shut up because I felt I owed both women the same debt. They had both put me in, and I, I couldn't do any more to help anybody. But that was my first knowledge that Agnes was the one who had pulled the thing on Doris, who had gotten rid of Doris Quinlan. And what I, I say that to say that that was my first inkling of what I would what I would ultimately find out. And it made a lot of sense to me. Oh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into the fact that I started off with a bad relationship with Joe Stewart because I never said anything to Joe Stewart. Joe Stewart called me up to the, his office after he was in, put in. He said to me, you're the only person in this company who uh, has not been up here to wish me uh, well for becoming the new producer. And uh, I said, well, I have a problem with uh, the king is dead, long live the king. I said, but aside from that, I thought Doris was doing a good job. And aside from that, she's the person that I owed for my job. And I felt that it had nothing to do with you. It had very much to do with this is the woman that gave me my job. 
And I also felt she was doing a good job and it wasn't fair. And he said, well, I don't see it that way. And uh, that was the end of it.